Ladies and gentlemen, when I was a young uh, leader, youth leader of my party in the uh, 70s, I recall that there was a well-sworn saying that uh, the young people represent the future. I dislike this because the young people are here today, as they were in the 70s. They are influencing societies uh, and the world already, so they are not in the future, they are in the current. And uh, that's why it's so important, and, and we can see it now very much in, uh, in the Arab world, how the young people actually was not, the, uh, well, they are the future, but they are here in order to, to, to influence. And one of those uh, who has been very influential, actually she started long before uh, the uprising started in the, in the Arab world, she organized um, uh, the organization Journalist Without Chains, and she started protesting um, in Sana uh, long before things started to, to um, develop in, for instance, uh, Tunisia. Uh, that's why uh, the committee that I am chairing uh, gave her the Nobel Peace Prize for 2011, and I'm very glad that she is with her uh, with us today. What I call the new voices in the world. Um, we really need them, and we are looking forward to listen to Tavakol Karman, please. In the name of God the Merciful, good morning to everyone. Mr. Yaglant, Secretary General of the Council of Europe. Mr. Ban Ki-moon, Secretary General of the United Nations. Mr. Roland Ries, Mayor of Strasbourg. Mr. Bernard Cazeneuve, Minister responsible for European Affairs. Ladies and gentlemen, once again, I would like to uh, welcome you and uh, say salam alaikum. Ladies and gentlemen, it is for me a happy paradox for this meeting to take place precisely on the date of the first anniversary of the Nobel Peace Prize I was awarded in 2011. Many people in Yemen were happy to see me uh, get that prize. Many people from the Arab world, many women in the world were happy, but also so all those who are fighting for democracy and for peaceful change. All these people welcomed that prize because the prize was awarded not not only uh, on the 7th of October to myself, Tawakol uh, Karman, Tawakol Abdel Salam Karman, so not only to me, but to all those men, to all those women who are fighting for just causes. Dear brothers, dear sisters, democratic and civil rights for all citizens can no longer be disregarded today. We know. We know today that everyone uh, recognizes that these rights are fair and just. And there are many texts that lay down those rights. The principles are accepted in many declarations, in many treaties, in many international conventions. But what we're lacking is the commitment, is true respect for these principles and these texts at international level. And in 
many countries in the world. What we're lacking is an institutional framework, is a regional, international mechanism to make sure that these principles are enjoyed by all the people in all countries. Ladies and gentlemen, you know that the Universal Declaration for Human Rights, despite its importance, despite it being a source of inspiration, is simply a covenant that is not binding for many governments, for many regimes in the world. Uh, on behalf or, of, or in the name of sovereignty or the uh, right not to interfere in a country, you can see that these uh, principles, these rights are uh, trampled by uh, despots who disregard both individual and collective rights in uh, dictatorships who, that uh, repress any form of liberty. These regimes uh, trample the rights of their people. Everything is used for the sake of the regime, for the people who represent these regimes. The big challenge for mankind today is to make sure that the United Nations Charter and the Universal Declaration for Human Rights, that all all international conventions and covenants on civil and political rights, on economic and social rights, that all these instruments become truly binding instruments for all countries. When those rights are breached, when those texts are violated, then the United Nations, the international community should be able to react. Uh, and uh, the Secretary General of the United Nations is present here. And therefore, on behalf of the United Nations, we should be able to make sure that that organization can actually react everywhere whenever someone is a victim of injustice. That should be the main challenge for the world today. Freedoms must be restored. As I was saying, that is the key challenge for the world today. These governments that um, oppress their people, uh, confiscate their rights and freedoms, those governments must be able to face institutions, international bodies, in partnership or within the United Nations uh, that have to be able to dissuade those governments from going further, from further suppressing freedoms. All texts, agreements, treaties on fighting poverty, on respecting the environment, on economic and social rights, all those texts must be safeguarded. We must ensure their implementation. We must, must avoid um, being faced with the argument of non-interference. Dear brothers, dear sisters, today what we want is genuine, comprehensive, true democracy for all people in the world on their territory, on their land. Uh, within every village, all the villagers that we are all uh, members of. And we must also uh, bear in mind the positive and negative impact of globalization for people who want to be equal citizens, who want justice, who want to be able to live in dignity. Therefore, the uh, important issue Today, the most important issue for us today is will we be able to uh, transform globalization into a positive force, a force that is there for all the people in the world? Will we be able to make the necessary measures and policies to, to create, establish the necessary organizations and international bodies in order to safeguard that justice, to make sure that that dream becomes truth? When will we be able to win that battle? Therefore, 
A positive globalization faces many hurdles today. We need to approach national sovereignty differently. We're in a different framework today. We must forget about the past and understand that the future is different. Globalization will be uh, fair and just only when all the people in the world, even, even the weakest people, will feel that they benefit from that globalization in, in an equal manner, that the benefits of globalization are the same for all the people in the world. The peoples of the world today, and in particular people from developing countries or less advanced countries, these people who are fighting for freedom, democracy and justice, these people really have the feeling that despite all these opportunities offered by, offered by globalization, that globalization is basically unfair. What do we see uh, with globalization? Pollution, the destruction of ecosystems, the destruction of our land, uh, an increasing number of natural disasters, of earthquakes, of uh, fires, and unfortunately, developing countries are the ones suffering most from these phenomena, far more than any other. You also have the economic and financial crises that have a terrible impact on those people. Dear friends, uh, today we're facing uh, far worse challenges than in 1992 during the Rio World Summit. At the time, we felt that there was genuine consensus. We thought that we were experiencing true commitment of all countries for development, political, social, economic development, but also for sustainable development that would include protection of the environment at its heart. Unfortunately, today, Many individuals, many people in the world today are increasingly hungry. Illiteracy is worsening. Uh, we are destroying our ecosystems that could support growth and development in those countries. Add to that uh, despotism, corruption, uh, and for this reason I urge you in the context of this forum, in the Council of Europe, and in partnership with the United Nations, I urge you to remember that we need true recommendations that will allow us to find solutions to overcome all the hurdles I have just mentioned. Ladies and gentlemen, there isn't a unique democratic model, but what we do have are standards, principles of good governance. These principles are recognized throughout the world, and we must rely on those principles to ensure good governance. It, these standards are a true achievement for mankind, and we must draw on those standards in order to identify clear objectives, clear programs with uh, tangible objectives within national, regional and international action plans in order to support the developing countries and the countries that are uh, less advanced. What, what do we want? We want a stronger role for Europe. We want constant work of the United Nations in order to fight discrimination in all its forms, to respect the rights of migrants and to make sure that uh, acts of racism and hatred disappear. We face these acts in many of our societies. We're seeking cohesion, tolerance between our people. This is what we want. And today I ask the Council of Europe to help us to find funds to support very important projects in our countries, in the world today. I'm thinking of communi communication, information technology, the rights of minorities, social cohesion, fighting organized crime. All that must be coordinated in the Council of Europe and also within the United Nations. We must follow
follow up on all the projects that already exist in these many areas. I hope that this forum will allow us to identify practical, pragmatic mechanisms to strengthen freedom of expression and freedom of thought. We must strengthen equality between men and women. We must support the empowerment of women and their active participation in public life. I hope that through this conference, we will adopt binding legislation that will ensure the participation of women in all the governments that are um, emerging today. And I hope that we will have at least 30% of women present in these governments and in these bodies. Ladies and gentlemen, the world today has witnessed an Arab Spring that is ongoing. It hasn't stopped. We have seen men, women, young people go out in the street to express their um, thirst for freedom. We are tired of corruption, of dictatorships. We went, we took to the streets in order to ask for the fall of those regimes, the end of repression. These people walked out with uh, flowers in their hands and they faced bullets. These people are still fighting. They managed to uh, uh, get those regimes to collapse, and they are now trying to establish uh, civil regimes, uh, regimes that respect freedom and equal citizenship and the rule of law. The Arab Spring looks very much like the uh, spring of the Eastern European countries after the collapse of the Berlin Wall. It's a fight for freedom. It's a very brave fight. It's a quest for rights, economic, political, social rights. And all that requires from the Europeans and from the United Nations a strong and firm reaction to allow us to get sustainable development, fair development, balanced development, at political, economic, and social level. I would like to say once again that this uh, spring of freedom, of uh, courage, this spring that sought justice, economic, political, social rights, that requires from Europe and the United Nations a firm position, a firm stance that will allow us to um, get sustainable development in all areas, political, social, social, economic areas, democratic transitions, and the thorough democratic reform that our countries are experiencing today, that must rely or be based on sustainable growth, lasting growth. We need social and economic reform as well, so that the political reform is not slowed down, is not halted. There can be no economic development without political development, but uh, there can be no political development without economic development either. We need social and economic rights. Democracy lies at the heart of that. Political reform lies at the heart of that. I would therefore like to urge you during this forum, forum to adopt initiatives, true and comprehensive initiatives that will allow all these countries that are going through uh, political and social transition to support all these men and women in their peaceful fight to repatriate all the funds that were um, hijacked by our regimes and to make sure that they go back to the countries they were aimed at and to make sure that those uh, regimes do not enjoy impunity, to make sure that all these civil and military regimes who um, perpetrated massacres against people who were demonstrating peacefully must pay for what they did and uh, for that we will have sustainable development with an economic, uh, political and social framework. Dear brothers, dear sisters, from this city of peace, a city of rights, Strasbourg, the symbol of freedom and human rights, I want to say from this city that today, while we're meeting on the issue of democracy, hundreds of people are dying, thousands of people are dying in Syria, fighting for freedom and their dignity. Dear friends, 
many squares in Damascus, in Aleppo, in Dehar, in Derezo, in other cities as well. Syria is being destroyed. Syria is being destroyed every day. Syria is collapsing every day while men and women are fighting for dignity. Massacres are being perpetrated by the regime of Bashar al-Assad. It is a corrupt and unfair regime. Here, from this city in Strasbourg, I would like to express our despair faced with this international paralysis. The Syrian people is suffering. This brave people is suffering. We must show our ethical and moral support, first and foremost, to the Syrian people. When I ask all international bodies to create buffer zones, humanitarian corridors, in order to protect the Syrian people from this regime, this, uh, the regime of Bashar al-Assad. When I say that to international bodies, am I, am I disregarding human rights principles? Am I disregarding all these rights we have to protect? When I turn to Mr. Ban Ki-moon and Mr. Yagland, and I ask for that, and I ask that from all the representatives of Europe, of the world, when I ask for these humanitarian corridors to be created, is that not mindful of human rights. I just want safe routes to make sure that we can provide aid to these people, that we can save these men and these women who are attacked on a daily basis. Every day, massacres are committed. Hundreds and thousands of people are dying. When I ask for that, I don't think I am disregarding the mankind's commitment for peace, because protecting the vi victims lies at the heart of peace, the heart of our message for peace. The only thing we are asking for is justice. I am asking uh, this for the sake of peace, for stability, because stability, justice, and peace go hand in hand. You nations of the world, you must prove that these good intentions you express, you mean them. We must help the Syrians face this daily suffering. The uh, wounds of the Syrian people are still very very deep, and um, our conscience suffers from that. It is too painful. Mankind is suffering today, and we must now take action. All we are asking for is uh, mercy. Thank you very much.